Today, I'm going to talk to you about some of my work on, on the biodiversity puzzle. I want to start by showing you this famous image of Earth from space. And I think this is a really interesting image. And one of the things that's cool about it is that just by looking at this, this famous blue marble, we can actually see and understand a lot about the Earth system in terms of ecology, in terms of geodynamics and other things. For example, you can look at, at the land on this and you can see that some places are brown and some places are green. That tells us something about the distribution of plant productivity and biomass across the surface of the Earth. But there are some things you can't see from this image. And one of the most profound features of our planet is completely invisible in this view. And it's the diversity of life on Earth. So let's imagine that you, were, you had some magic glasses that would let you see the amount of biodiversity in different parts of the Earth's oceans. Maybe we would see a view of Earth that would look something like this. And so what you see here, this is biodiversity in marine fishes. And so you can see that so warm colors are, are lots of species diversity and cool colors are places with low species diversity. And places like the tropical Indo-Pacific, those warm coral reef environments just light up with lots of species diversity. But there are lots of places on the surface of the Earth that have relatively low species diversity. These are cold places. They're the open oceans or the bottom of the oceans. And so some places clearly have lots of species and some places have relatively few species. And this pattern is far more general than simply marine fishes. So if you go down the road about 15 miles from here, you can go to the Uni University of Michigan's own ES George Ecological Reserve. And in a single square kilometer, you can find about 45 species of trees. But if you compare that to what you'd see somewhere like the Western Amazon, where also in a also green square kilometer of, of forest habitat, you would find more than a thousand species of trees. And so I'm a biodiversity scientist and, and I study these types of patterns and others to try to understand what affects bi biological diversity on this planet in space and through time. And so in my lab, we study how species form, why they go extinct, why there are so many species or so few species. In short, we're interested in what controls the amount of biodiversity on earth. Now, this turns out to be a very hard problem. You might look at this, this, this marine fish diversity map here and say, well, why are there so many species of fish in the oceans in the tropical Indo-Pacific? Well, one hypothesis might be that, well, we'll get more species in places where new species form quickly. That's an obvious hypothesis. Species, let's say there's something special about those warm tropical reef environments that causes more species to form quickly. But you get this pile up of biodiversity just jamming all these species into that particular area. Well, we could test that hypothesis, and uh, you might ask, how can we actually estimate how fast rates of species form? So this is something that we do in my lab. We take, we use genetics and math and statistics and paleontology and estimate the rates at which new species form and the rates at which they go extinct. So let's imagine we want to test this hypothesis. Well, let's imagine we could make a map that actually showed us how, showed us how fast species are forming in different parts of the world. Well, if we're going to make a similar map to what you see here, we would have a map where, where red indicates fast rates of species formation and blue indicates cool or slow rates of species formation. Now, we've actually made that map, and it looks like this. Remember, top is biodiversity, bottom is rates of species formation. And what you can see is that these maps look completely different. So the places on the surface of the Earth that have the most species diversity are not the places that have the fastest rates of species formation. In fact, it's the complete opposite. The places on Earth's surface that have the fastest rates of species formation are the cold water oceans of the Arctic and the Antarctic, which are also associated with the lowest species diversity. And so the point here is that common sense intuition, common sense explanations often fail when we're thinking about large-scale patterns of biological diversity. Our intuition just isn't up for, under, for making sense of some of these large-scale patterns. Now, there's another reason why explaining biodiversity is difficult. And I'm going to give you a little example from some of our, some of our work on tropical rainforest diversity. So we've been working on why there are so many species of reptiles and amphibians in the Amazon. And this is an interesting problem because the Amazon is really the center for terrestrial biodiversity for a whole host of groups of plants and animals, such as insects, reptiles, amphibians, birds. The Amazon really is the global center for terrestrial biodiversity. And so... But if we're going to study this problem, the first thing that we need is basic data on what organisms do in nature. So, and it turns out that for most organisms, we actually don't have the fundamental data on what they do. 
So you take, for example, this Amazonian pit viper right here. Well, this thing has been was dis, dis, formally described over 200 years ago, and yet we don't have the most basic information about its ecology or biology in the natural world. We don't know how abundant it is. We don't know what habitats it uses. We don't know what it eats. We don't know how it interacts with parasites and pathogens and predators and so on. All of these things basically have us in the dark for solving these big questions. And so it's a little bit like trying to predict protein structure and function without knowing anything about the chemical properties of the amino acids that make up proteins themselves. So the first issue here is that we lack the most basic data to solve the biodiversity puzzle. So we can't even, we, 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 the, the, there's uh, our, our intuition essentially fails us and we don't have the data we need to test our theories. Now the problem is even more severe because the data that we need are being lost forever in real time. And what I mean by that is that there are numerous impacts around the world due to humans that are rapidly reshaping species abundances, their distributions, and their ecologies as we speak. And all in all, across this, if we add this all up, what it, what it means is that we are losing biodiversity information faster than we are losing species themselves due to extinction. So we're basically losing the information that we need to solve this biodiversity puzzle because of things like, like climate change, uh, deforestation and other human impacts. So where does this leave us? Well, I've told you that this is a this biodiversity puzzle is a hard problem, that we need tons of additional data, and that we are literally burning the data that we need before we can even collect it. So we're, how can we possibly solve this puzzle? Well, what I believe is that our natural history collections are actually the key to solving this, this biodiversity puzzle. And so here at the University of Michigan, we have one of the world's largest biodiversity research facilities. And this museum and museum, natural history museums more generally, are basically contain, contain snapshots of, of species diversity in space and time. Snapshots that we can use for all sorts of questions that will help us understand how and why there are so many species in places like the Amazon. And you might think of natural history collections as something like a warehouse where there are lots of preserved lizards and frogs, but in fact, these dead animals are a source of the living data that we need to answer some of the most fundamental questions about how our earth works. So you could take this tray of dead frogs right here, for example. This is a time capsule because all of these, all of these frogs were captured in the same place on a single steamy Amazonian night. And it's, of course, we're not only taking the frogs, we we're taking everything that comes along with them. We have genomes, transcriptomes, microbiomes, potentially bioactive compounds and so on. And of course, these things provide information about emerging infectious diseases and disease dynamics as well. Uh, perhaps zoonoses like the next COVID-19. And Aubrey Gordon is gonna say a little bit more about a partnership between the museums and the, and the biosciences initiative in a few minutes as well. And of course, we also take information on the ecology of these animals and life and link it to these specimens as well. So, and all of this works out to the types of information that we need to solve these fundamental biodiversity questions. Now, we can't get all the information that we need from our existing collections. And, and in fact, the, the, the universe of biodiversity is essentially filled, our knowledge of the biodiversity universe is filled with gaping holes. And so for that reason, it's essential that we continue to run these large collaborative expeditions to places like the Amazon, where we can continue to collect new data. And we, we take, on these expeditions, we take students and researchers from the University of Michigan and we work in collaboration with, with, with individuals, with researchers from Peru and other places, and we share our specimens and, and make sure that these resources are accessible to the global community. So how are we gonna solve the biodiversity puzzle? I do predict that in the end, these specimens, these are going to, are going to serve as the key source of data that will let us answer some of the most challenging questions in the life sciences. And for me, it's very humbling to think about the fact that these specimens that we collect, these biodiversity time capsules, are essentially something that's going to be looked at in 50 or 100 years by researchers who are using them to answer questions that we haven't even thought of yet, or using tools that probably don't even exist. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll turn it over to our next MBioFARS awardee, Dana Dolanoy. Thank you.